President. Senator. That every everyone agrees that what happened here on January 6th was an abomination. But that is simply not true. That is simply not true. Many of my Republican colleagues will say the right things on the Senate floor, occasionally will whisper the right things to us when the cameras aren't watching. But a recent poll, a nonpartisan Monmouth University poll, asked Republican voters whether or not they thought January 6th was a legitimate protest. And guess what? Half of Republican voters in this country say that the invasion of this Capitol that involved chants for the death of the Vice President, a gallows outside the United States Capitol, half of Republicans believe that that was a legitimate protest. Seven out of 10 Republicans today don't believe that Joe Biden is the legitimate president. They believe that Donald Trump won the election despite the fact that he lost it by 7 million votes. And the reason for that is mostly that the leader of the Republican Party, Donald Trump, has been legitimizing violence, urged those protests and that insurrection attempt, cheered them at the end of the day on January 6th, and also because we have seen mostly silence from mainstream Republicans who know better but don't want to pick a fight with President Trump. And so, yes, we are worried about the future of our republic. We are worried about the future of our republic because a mainstream political party has gotten behind the idea that power matters more than elections, that violence is a legitimate means of protest. And so this idea that everybody agrees that January 6th was an abomination just isn't true. It's not true, and that's in part why we are so worried. I want to talk about two subjects today, and the first is this question of the rules of the Senate, because I've listened with great interest over the last few days is my Republican colleagues have come down to the floor to extol the virtues of Senate tradition as they explain the dangers of changing the rules so that a majority vote in the Senate can pass legislation. It doesn't sound like a radical idea that if the majority of senators want a piece of legislation to pass, it should pass. But this idea that the filibuster is part of the original design of our democracy or our Senate, or that the current use of the filibuster is consistent with Senate tradition, it's just not true. Our founding fathers, yeah, they built a system of government that was designed to make rapid change, even change supported by the majority of voters, really, really hard to implement, right? They designed two different legislative chambers, a president with veto power, staggered terms for senators. But our founding fathers considered a supermajority requirement for legislation in the Congress, and they rejected it as too great a limitation on the will of the people. Now, admittedly, at the time of our founding, there were other checks on the voters' will being quickly transformed into policy change. Back then, for instance, only white men could vote. The citizenry at the time wasn't even trusted to directly elect the members of this body. But in the decades that followed, the American people demanded more democracy, and they got it. Why? Because as our grand experiment of democracy continued, we saw proof of concept. The people could be trusted to govern themselves. They could choose leaders that were more able, more honest, more effective than any king or queen or sultan or emperor. So we extended the franchise universally. We decided to have the Senate be directly elected. And as America expanded, the new states out in the West, they gobbled up even more democracy. The West decided to elect not just legislators, but judges and prosecutors, dog catchers and insurance commissioners. Majoritarian rule, as America grew, it became addictive. And as our country grew, our citizens demanded more of it. Now, in the context of the founders' intentions and the long-term trend towards more democracy, this 60-vote requirement, this supermajority requirement in the Senate, which doesn't exist in any other high-income democracy, it stands out like a sore, rotting thumb. This anti-majoritarian drain clog designed intentionally 
to stop the majority of Americans from getting what they want from government. Because that's what it is. Why should it not be up to the voters and not politicians to decide the laws of this nation? With a 60 vote threshold, that decision is robbed from voters. Given that only one third of the Senate is up for election every two years, it's just impossible for voters on their own to move one party from say 46 or 48 members of this body to 60 members in one election. And we all know this, but right now the American public is in no mood for the choices of elites to be continually substituted for their collective judgment. Right now, Americans are in a pretty revolutionary mood. And you can understand why more Americans today than any time in recent history see themselves on the precipice of financial and spiritual ruin. So why on earth would our message amidst this growing populist tempest be to tell voters that rules are required to protect them from their bad judgment, to take from them purposefully the ability to change policies whenever and however they wish? Now, Senate Republicans will say that even though the filibuster is anti-majoritarian, right, it is, it says that even if the public installs a majority in the Senate that wants policy A, the rules are going to be constructed in the Senate to prevent it from happening. Senate Republicans can say even though it's anti-majoritarian, it's for good reason. Because, as I've heard many of my colleagues say, it promotes compromise. Well, I've been in the Senate now for eight, nine years. Once in a blue moon, like this summer, on the infrastructure bill, there is a big bipartisan achievement. But for anyone who believes that the rules of the Senate right now incentivizes bipartisanship should just watch the Senate for like a few days. Today, the 60 vote threshold just allows the minority to sit back and say no, 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 over and over again. In large part because its usage has changed so much. It didn't used to be that the filibuster, the 60-vote threshold, was applied to everything. Up until the 1970s, cloture votes were almost non-existent in the Senate. Big things routinely passed with 50 votes. In think about this. In 1994, Senator Feinstein forced a vote here on one of the most controversial topics that we could talk about, a ban on assault weapons. It received, in 1994, fewer votes than did the Manchin-Toomey background checks bill 30 years later. But the assault weapons ban, arguably way more controversial than the background checks bill, passed and became law. Well, the background checks bill didn't. Why? Because in 1994, many important votes, even the assault weapons ban, were allowed to proceed on a majority vote basis. That all changed, mostly when Democrats won the Senate in 20, 2007 and Barack Obama was elected president. But no matter who started this policy of applying the 60 vote threshold to everything, today, listen, both parties use it. Democrats used it when we were in the minority. The practice of the filibuster it doesn't jive with this clarion call of adhering to Senate tradition because Senate tradition is not to use the 60 vote threshold on everything. Let's be honest, we're not going back to a world in which senators self-regulate the filibuster. And there is no sign that the claim, the filibuster as an incentive for bipartisanship, is going to suddenly come true. Today, millions of voters are wondering why they vote to change the people who get elected, but then nothing actually changes. And we should have a better answer than just Senate tradition. Mr. President, um, I'd like the following remarks to be reflected in the record uh, as uh, distinct from the prior speech. Without objection. Thank you. Um, Mr. President, uh, President Biden's decision to remove our remaining troops from Afghanistan was the right one. No question about it. President Trump set the Biden administration up for failure. Trump's agreement with the Taliban committed us to withdrawing all of our troops. And had Biden torn up that agreement, he would have had to have sent tens of thousands of troops into Afghanistan to push back the Trump-era Taliban gains. The American public would not have supported another Afghanistan troop surge, and for good reason. 
The overnight collapse of the Afghan army and government was frankly proof that 20 years of nation building had failed and another 20 years wasn't going to result in a different outcome. President Biden made the right decision to leave. The American people, by a large margin, support that decision. But right now, we need to be honest. The question of what to do now, as Afghanistan crumbles into a nightmarish failed state, is a moral knot. It's almost impossible to untangle. And as chair of the Foreign Relations Subcommittee that oversees Afghanistan policy, I've thought a lot about this question, and I've come to a few conclusions that I want to share quickly with my colleagues. First, let's just take a minute to talk about what it's like to be living in Afghanistan right now. It is a nightmare. Once the U.S. military occupation and all of the foreign aid that came with it disappeared, the Afghanistan economy collapsed predictably. Today, winter is setting in, and more than half the population, 23 million people, don't have enough food to eat. By this summer, 97% of Afghans will be living below the poverty line, trying to survive on less than $2 a day. With 9 million people just one step away from famine, this humanitarian crisis could kill more Afghans than the past 20 years of war. And herein lies the quandary. On one side is what sounds like a pretty clear and convincing argument. Essentially, the Taliban has to own this. We warned the Taliban that this collapse would occur if they took the nation by force. That's why we sat at the table with them and tried to explain that it was in their best interests and the best interests of the nation for the Taliban to share power with the elected Afghan government, but the Taliban did not listen. They took Kabul and they should own the results. To send billions to solve the humanitarian crisis they caused would be to bail the Taliban out and incentivize other insurgent groups to make similar rash decisions. But on the other hand, is an equally clear and convincing argument. We stood by the Afghan people for two decades, protecting them, working with them. We spent hundreds of billions of dollars helping to raise up the future of millions of Afghan families, women and girls. And now those same Afghans, those same families, the ones that frankly have nothing to do with the Taliban, are dying potentially by the tens of thousands, and we have the power to do something about it. How could we let the Afghan people die needlessly if we have the power to stop it? Now, we possess this power because it is U.S. policy toward the Taliban government that is contributory towards this crisis. It's not the proximate cause, but it's contributory. When Kabul fell suddenly last August, the administration sensibly froze $7 billion of the former Afghan government's assets that are held at the Federal Reserve. We didn't want the Taliban to control it. But that money isn't ours. It rightfully belongs to the Afghan people. Further, our sanctions on the Taliban, completely justified because of the Taliban's embrace of terrorism, essentially handcuffs the Afghan economy and therefore contributes to the country's economic descent. So we need to understand that our policies are contributing to the humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan. But what if these two points, that the Taliban should own this, and that we can't stand by idly while people die, what if they aren't in 100% contrast? What if we could help the Afghan people without directly empowering the Taliban? Wouldn't that be the best possible answer? The good news is, is that the middle road is possible. I'm gonna be honest, it's not easy, but it is possible. Over the last 20 years, the United States has spent billions in our taxpayer dollars to build schools and health clinics and a robust civil service. The number of schools today, for instance, is five times higher in Afghanistan than it was in 2001. That's because of American investment. We can and we should find ways to pay the salaries of those who work at these non-political institutions through the UN and NGOs on the ground, going around the Taliban-led government to keep those essential services running and inject some much needed money into the economy. Again, this isn't easy to do, but it is worthwhile given the stakes. We can also support the UN directly. Yesterday, the UN asked for a $4.5 billion call in humanitarian aid to stave off catastrophe in Afghanistan. This is the largest single country appeal in history, and that should tell you about the scale of the crisis that we're facing. It's larger than what we see in Syria or Yemen or Ethiopia. I support the administration's decision to dedicate an additional $308 million in humanitarian aid to Afghanistan. That money is going to help save lives, but Congress should authorize more. Make no mistake, Madam President, the Taliban and, frankly, 20 years of corrupt Afghan governments, they do own this 
debacle. The choices they made have led to this day. But our hands aren't clean. Our mismanaged occupation, it is part of the story. And right now, as the Afghan economy collapses and families face starvation, burying our heads in the sand is not a solution. We can find ways to save lives without unreasonably empowering the Taliban. I yield back.